Let me turn to the third of the myths I want to cover. This is a myth closely related to the Great Depression myth. It is a myth that somehow or other the private market has failed to provide certain important services. And the government has had to step in in response to an overwhelming public demand in order to provide those services. The reality is very different. The reality is that if you look at every program that the government has adopted in the direction of extending its scope, it took an enormous propaganda campaign by special propaganda groups to get those measures passed. There was no underlying public demand for those measures. On the contrary, the demand had to be created. It had to be developed. It had to be produced. And it was created, it was developed, it was produced by people who sincerely, I'm not questioning their sincerity, who sincerely wanted to see an expansion in the scope of government. Let me take some of the most prominent examples. Let me take the example which today is the greatest, uh, uh, greatest uh, sacred cow of them all, Social Security. Was there an overwhelming demand for Social Security in the 1930s when the law was adopted? Far from it. There was no public demand for it. It had to be sold. How was it sold? By the slickest devices of Madison Avenue. By imaginative packaging and deceptive labeling. Social Security was sold as an insurance scheme. It is not an insurance scheme. There is very little relationship to the amount of money any one individual pays and the amount of money he is entitled to receive. Social Security is a combination of a bad tax system with a bad way of distributing welfare. It's got two components, and I have never known anybody, whatever his political or other persuasion, who would defend either component separately. If you look at the tax system, who can defend a, a wage tax? A tax on wages up to a maximum. A tax on work, a tax which discourages employers from hiring people and discourages people from going to work. And a tax which is borne by the lowest wage groups. It's a regressive tax. You could never, in a, in a, in a millions of years, Sundays, you could never have gotten such a tax passed as a tax. Look at the benefit arrangements. Here you have an arrangement under which the amount of money a person receives does not depend on his poverty or his indigence. It depends on the accident of what industry he worked in. If he happened to work in a covered industry, he gets a, a, a benefit. If he happens to work in a non-covered industry, he doesn't. If uh, he has only worked a certain number of quarters and not more, no matter how much, how indigent he is, he doesn't get anything. If he's 65 and he decides to continue to work, earning more than a modest amount per year, not only doesn't he get a benefit, but to add insult to injury, he has to pay taxes on the wages he is receiving in order to finance the benefit he is not receiving. <laughs> if a man who is 65 years old and has a million dollars in income from property, he is and doesn't work, he gets his full Social Security benefit, tax-free. If the same man goes to work and earns $20,000 a year, he is in the position I just described, he doesn't get any benefit. Is there anybody who would justify that system of distributing benefits? And I could go on to all the uh, difficulties with it. Uh, I've only touched the surface. Note the misleading language. The Social Security system consistently refers to the taxes you pay as a contribution. Now tell me, do you regard taxes as contributions? <laughs> the word contribution denotes voluntary arrangements. If you buy an insurance program, you are contributing freely. If you contribute to the United Way freely, you're contributing freely. But if you pay taxes on your wages as a condition of being employed, that's a tax, it's not a contribution. Again, it always refers to the payments people get as benefits. They are not benefits, they're subsidies. 
What you have is a system of subsidizing people on the one hand and of taxing it. What about the claim that it's insurance, that there's a relationship between the two? Well, there is a minor relationship. It is true that on the whole, those people who pay more will receive more, other things the same. But every student of the subject has pointed out that the relationship is very small, that most payments are independent of most receipts. Moreover, what you really have is not a system under which people are providing for their own security, as a social security system will say it, as they describe it. In their pamphlets, they describe it as a way in which 90% of American workers are providing for their own future. That's nonsense. What people today are doing is paying taxes today to pay the subsidies to the people who are receiving benefits today. What you have is a system of taxing the young at any point in time to subsidize the old. Now, there may be nothing wrong with that. For the moment, I'm not discussing that issue. I'm discussing whether Social Security was a response to a broad-scale public demand or whether it had to be sold to the people by the worst devices of Madison Avenue. And the answer is it clearly was the latter. What you have is a system under which people today are being taxed to pay benefits today to the people who are receiving them. So far, those people who have been receiving payments have received much more than the actuarial value of what they paid. That's because you've had a growing working force, you've had higher wages being paid, wage rates have gone up very, I mean the wage tax has gone up very sharply. But the number of recipients is growing relative to the number of people paying. And that's why Social Security is currently in so much financial trouble. That's why the so-called uh, reserve, which is not a reserve at all, the so-called reserve has been getting smaller and smaller. And that's why you have all the agitation for Congress to do something to make Social Security again financially responsible. Again, for the moment, I'm not discussing whether Social Security or the separate parts are good or bad, but only whether it can be regarded as a program adopted in response to a great public demand. Let me take another more recent movement. Consider the imposition on you and me and on our automobiles of all sorts of safety equipment, so-called safety equipment. Nothing to prevent us individually from buying it. But now we are required to buy it by government. Why? Was there a great public demand? Not at all. There was a man named Ralph Nader. Now maybe he arose in response to a public demand, but if so, it was a public demand for entertainment, not for safety. <laughs> but Ralph Nader launched a major propaganda campaign. And as a result of this propaganda campaign, as a result of a great selling effort, also characterized by misrepresentation. Also, as you know, uh, his original weapon was a book, safe at, uh, Unsafe at Any Price, which damned the Corvair as being an unsafe and a knowingly unsafe car. Later studies have demonstrated that his claim was not justified. But that did not prevent it from having its effect. It did not prevent it from adopting it. But the extent to which this did not result from a great public clamor can be shown by what has happened whenever the, uh, uh, the the agency that was established to administer auto safety regulations has overstepped its bounds. You will recall that a few years ago, it tried to impose the requirement of an interlock that no car could be started unless the seat belts were fastened. And that produced such a great public outcry that Congress stepped in and it had to be uh, rescinded. You are now having a similar kind of a controversy about the airbag. Or again, let me take a very different example, one which has not yet emerged, fortunately, the drive for national health insurance. Is there a widespread drive for national health insurance? Not so you can notice it. Indeed, the proponents of it have been trying to get it passed year after year, and so far they haven't gotten it passed. As I say, fortunately, because if so-called national health insurance were passed, it would bear as little relationship to insurance as Social Security does. It's not a program for national health insurance at all. It's a program for socialized medicine. 
It's a program for making physicians uh, uh, government employees. It's a program for creating long waiting lines and inferior medical service. But that isn't the way it's labeled. But the pressure for it is having to be created and built up by propaganda. Or again, let me take another modern version. Has the FDA's ban on saccharin been in response to a great public outcry for it? 